guys, my name is Maria Stefanova and you're watching Wednesday Night Conversations. Thank you for tuning in. You want to cross train your musicians so they're all in shape and they can do better and they can advance technically. You can do that following the tips of our next guest, Ryan Ross. Ryan, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Maria. It's good to see you. Before we get going, I was hoping you could tell us just a little bit about what you do at the moment. We met 10 years ago. I was doing my master's in violin performance, and I believe you're doing a conducting degree. Uh, we taught at a festival at Texas, and a lot of time has passed since then. Yeah, so um, kind of like you, actually, I, I am not a native music educator. Um, I did my undergraduate in, in uh, performance as well. And then I did my master's degree in conducting. And uh, I, I studied uh, at Texas Tech with Gary Lewis. And basically anything good that I might possibly be doing in my classroom, I'm pretty sure that he is the one that taught all that stuff to me. He's a wizard and just such a life affirming human being. So, um, so yeah, I'm a, a conductor slash teacher. Um, I also conduct a professional group in the Dallas area, the Allen Philharmonic. It's one of the regional orchestras uh, that's spattered about the Dallas area. So, Thank you. And let's get straight into interleaving or cross-training for musicians. So um, interleaving, like I said, is something that I am so excited about. And uh, I gave a presentation at TMEA, Texas Music Educators Association, maybe three years ago at this point with my colleague, Amy Gross, on the way that we implement interleaving in our orchestra rehearsals. Um, so what I have... Uh, shared on the screen here is just a little bit about uh, is, is from the presentation that we gave, but I'm going to give like the, the short, like five or 10 minute uh, crash through on this. Um, so we call it uh, cross training, even though the technical term is interleaving. So you'll see cross training referred to in here. And what it breaks down to is that it's a, a practice or rehearsal strategy of practicing multiple things at once that increases a student's long-term retention and mastery. So uh, Maria, I mean, I'm sure you've had the experience of teaching something to your orchestra and then you come back to it, you know, the next rehearsal or a few days later, and it's like you've never practiced it, right? Um, and so the, the problem with that is is kind of the, the way that we default to in our rehearsals. Um, it's called block practice, and it really doesn't uh, lock in the gains the way that this other strategy does. So um, interleaving uh, originated about 30 to 40 years ago, and it was uh, researched by uh, motor skills researchers. So they were looking at uh, sports athletes. Um, and then over time, as they studied it more, um, they were finding that it's actually equally applicable to uh, music, to cognitive learning. Um, and so it, it's really kind of taking off. So. Here's the, the quick way that I can give the, uh, the introduction to it. So this is, this is my grandma. And uh, let's say that my grandma really loves birds and I really want to impress her with what I've learned about birds. So the traditional way that we would study is kind of shown here. It's uh, called blocked practice. And so you might sit down and in your study session, study everything that you can about cardinals. And then once you feel good with the cardinals, you move on to the mockingbirds. And then once you've mastered the mockingbirds, you move on to blue jays and then finally robins. I think that is at the end there. Um, the trouble is that when you come back to it the next day or the next week, you'll have probably forgotten a lot of the facts that you studied. And then you have an unhappy grandma. <laughs> so what interleaving is, is basically what you see here. It's studying multiple topics at the same time. Uh, so, you know, the first pass through, you study cardinals, blue dray, blue, bluebirds, um, mockingbirds, and then robins, but then you circle back around and you approach them again, and you're mixing it all up at the same time. And the end result of that is a happy grandma, right? So what's this look like in music is right here, you know, traditionally in our rehearsals, whether it's solo practice or ensemble practice, you kind of go to one spot and you practice it a bunch of times and you say, okay, that's good. Let's move on. And you practice the next spot and so on and so forth. And you can see down here are two models for interleaving um, where you're rehearsing multiple things in small chunks 
but you're constantly mixing it up and returning back to it. So um, the reason it works is that it basically puts a higher tax on the brain. Um, it, it's more dissonance as you're switching between the things. Um, that rapid switching uh, eventually leads to greater mastery. Um, so the, the warning that is so important to give when you're starting to experiment with this is that in the short term, your students will actually be worse at what they're doing. <laughs> and so, you know, it's really easy just to throw up your hands and say, oh, this is not working for me. Um, but the research, the science shows that in the long term, um, you can get like up to like a 70% better retention. And I'll, I'll share just a few of those. Um, the, other, the other thing to be careful about, I guess, is that students can feel discouraged because they don't feel the success. You know, if you're just repeating, repeating, repeating one thing, you know, you do get better and you like, okay, I'm getting this. Um, when you're constantly switching between all these different ideas, you know, it, you don't see the immediate returns. And so sometimes the students can even feel like they don't, they're not making the gains they want to. So you just have to make sure they understand kind of the overall process and, um, you know, can, can buy into that. So um, here's just some of the research. I'm not gonna go through all this like in super detail, but uh, one of the first studies was back in 86 on uh, badminton people. And, you know, they had one group practice uh, in a block practice model and one uh, group practicing an interleaved model. And uh, the interleaved group performed 36% better on both retention and transfer. And the, the really interesting thing here is that um, in the practicing, they only practice serving from like the right side of the badminton court. And for the interleavers, they actually improved their serves from the left side of the court even though they had never practiced it because that interleaving locked things in so strongly for them. Whereas the block practicers did not have that transfer from the right side of the court to the left side of the court. Um, they've also done it like with some baseball and you can see here, um, block practicers only showed a 25% improvement um, on hitting three types of pitches. Whereas the interleavers showed a 57% improvement in this case. Um, they've done it with medical students They've done it with uh, like just core class math. Um, and this one's really impressive. In this particular study, the interleavers, uh, one day later, they did 25% better. But one month later, they had 76% better retention, which is like mind blowing, right? Um, and then finally, there is also music research on it uh, with some like beginner clarinetist and stuff like that. So it, it, it's this thing that if you can if you can be patient with it and buy in, you can really get some awesome retention. Um, and so, you know, we've, we started experimenting with this in our orchestra program. Like, how do you, how do you rehearse an orchestra of, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 kids in, in a structured way to utilize this idea? Um, and so I'll, I'll just share a few of those here. Um, so, Kind of the first idea to, to be aware of is choosing appropriate uh, material to cross train. So, um, you know, we, we've kind of found that three to five cuts to focus on at a time is best. If you're trying to cross train 10 different cuts, it just gets too discombobulated and it's like too much going on. And if, you know, maybe you're only cross training one or two spots, you can't mix it up enough and you can't, you know, roll it around and circle back to it in the right ways. Uh, so maybe like three to five cuts is better. And then, um, sorry about that. Shorter is also better. So like you're not cross training rehearsal A to rehearsal D. You're rehearsing, you're cross training like two to eight measures, like a small part of a phrase or, you know, a couple measures. Um, so that you're really like laser focused in on what you're, you're trying to cross train. Um, and, you know, when we do it, we try to select material that everybody plays on in the orchestra so that, you know, half the group is not just sitting there twiddling their thumbs while we're cross-training the first violins. Um, you know, even if the reason that you're cross-training these eight measures is for the first violins, really there's no reason that you can't have, like, the entire group cross-training in these various spots. 
Um, so I'll, I'm going to skip this. So I, the, the thing I should mention here, and this is on this slide, is that, you know, I'm talking about it as a rehearsal strategy, but this totally works for any kind of teaching you're doing. So like if you're a beginner teacher teaching elementary, um, you can cross train, you can do interleave practice on note reading, or if you're teaching vibrato or whatever. And I, I know I'm just like throwing out a lot of this stuff here. I'll kind of show you in just a minute how we pull it all back together. But, um, you know, it kind of breaks down to don't just practice vibrato. Like if you're teaching vibrato to your middle school group, don't just do that for five minutes at the beginning of class and then move on like five, one minute sessions spaced throughout the class where you move on to new material and then you come back to it really uh, that, that accomplishes interleaving and can really pay off um, with quicker learning and, and more retention down the line. Um, so like the way we do it is like once a week, we have new cross training spots. So like basically I, I kind of look at how my group's playing and I pick out the four or five spots that they're the worst at um, that really need the most focus. And so I'll just create a sheet of paper that says one, two, three, four, five, and it tells them what measure numbers we're focusing on. And it also tells them why we're doing that spot, like measures 12 through 18 so that cellos and basses can pr practice their spiccato bow stroke, you know, whatever it is. Um, that way they're not just mindlessly jumping between these spots. Um, and so basically you just rehearse these five spots. Um, so there's like four different ways that we do it. And the first one would be like a complete cycle. So you maybe at the beginning of class, like when you're doing your warm up period, you uh, go through these five cross training spots and each spot you're only practicing for like, 30 seconds, 45 seconds. If you, if you just fixate on it and you keep trying to rehearse it at, in that moment, you're not interleaving anymore. Now you're just block practicing it. So you, you do a spot, you play it. If there's something wrong, you definitely give feedback. You don't have to continue immediately onto the next thing, but you're giving like five words of feedback. You're not, you're not lingering on it. You do it again and maybe one more time. Then you move on to the next cross training spot. You do letter B, you do letter C, D, and then you move on to something else. You go and rehearse a piece for a while. And then after you rehearse that piece for a while, before you move on to the next one, you pull out your cross training sheet again and you revisit those things, maybe in a new order. And then maybe before class is over, you do it one last time. So, you know, you're only spending two, three minutes of time working on these spots, but you're revisiting it throughout the class. And because the kids are having to make those mental shifts between the different spots and from like normal rehearsal to cross training rehearsal, that's creating that, that dissonance in their brain and helping them uh, to like lock it in a lot stronger. Um, so like you can do that. You can also just focus on a small part. The one that I really like doing, we call it the bomb.com. Uh, don't go to that website. I have no idea what it is. It's probably something inappropriate. <laughs> um, but this is something that's kind of fun and it's a, it's like a small cycle and you just basically like set a timer on your computer and just no matter what is happening, like you're rehearsing your class like normal. And then every six minutes or whatever you decide, no matter what you stop and you do it really fast. And then you go back to rehearsing. And uh, it's like super, super jarring. So like, maybe I can show this video here um, of how, how I was implementing this. So this is my, my second orchestra a couple of years ago. And we were working on the Tchaikovsky Souvenir to Florence. And it has this wicked hard ricochet bowing in it. And, you know, so I, I decided we've got to cross train this because this is a disaster. Um, and so what I'm doing here, I'm rehearsing whatever pieces I'm rehearsing. And then every couple sec or, you know, every six minutes or so, I just stop them in the middle of the phrase, no matter what we're doing. And they, they do it and they know what we're about to do. So like they're ready to do the exercise that we're cross training. So like, I'll just show this for a minute and you can kind of see like what this looks like in practice. <laughs> Two, three, 
Right, so you get the idea. I mean, it's you're just constant returning. And, you know, I think a lot of people already maybe do stuff like this intuitively, um, but didn't know that there was like this, uh, like well-researched uh, cognition reason behind it, um, that it works. And then, you know, there, there's other ways that you can roll it in, but kind of here's the, the timeline that we use for it. Um, it's like the first two weeks, we're not, cross training on a new piece of music because it, the students have to have a little bit of familiarity with it before they, uh, you know, they start doing this. So uh, we, we don't start like the complete cross training cycles. That's the ones where we do like four or five or six different spots until like the third or fourth week of the concert cycle. Um, and then weeks four through six, uh, you know, you're, you're changing it. If, if the spots that you've been focusing on are like really good, you don't keep doing it. You move on to some new ones and, and uh, mix it up. And then kind of as we get closer to the performance, we usually do about an eight week cycle. Um, that's when you maybe like switch over to the bomb.com thing that you just saw and start um, focusing in on like very specific spots. Um, so like, I don't know, this, this is like super exciting to me. Uh, and I've seen the payoff. Uh, I think I actually have some quotes from, some of my students here and you can just kind of look at them, but like it, it messes with them. And at first they're just like, this is awful. Like, I don't understand what's going on. Why are we doing it like this? Cause they want to focus in, they want to be, they want to make it good before they move on. Uh, but, but you know, you get them to buy in, you help them understand the research and there's some good videos on YouTube that kind of like give like a four minute primer on it. You show that stuff to them so that they know why they're doing what they're doing. And it, it seriously pays off like huge, huge dividends. Um, so I've just been talking a ton. No, I think it's fascinating and it's very well explained. It is a podcast, so we're here to talk. And it just really makes me think how important it is to be conscious about what system you use and what exactly you do when you rehearse with your kids, whether you're in a private lesson situation or in the classroom. 
I was wondering and hoping you can give us examples of how block practice versus cross training may look in the classroom. Let's say I'm a beginning strength teacher and I'm teaching my kids how to play twinkle, twinkle, little star. How would the two different ways of approaching practicing look like in my classroom in this case? Right. So, um, you know, like the traditional way of practicing twinkle might be, um, well, so you're just working through the piece sequentially perhaps. And, uh, you know, in that first line of music, as it goes, you know, D, D, A, B, A, as they go to the G, maybe that, that G is out of tune as they string cross back down to the D string. So like a traditional way to practice that would be to like do that like six times, right? You might have the students hold an A and then hold a G and then you might have them play it, you know, up to that point and then hold the G when they get to it. And you might talk to them about like their elbow placement. Um, and, you know, you, you, might give them feedback six or seven times until you're satisfied with it. And then you say, okay, good. Let's try it again and let's keep going. And then you just kind of, you're done with it, right? You're, you, and that might work. I mean, sometimes that's all they need, right? They don't always need cross training to be able to improve something. Um, but the problem is, is like, let's say that every time you pull up twinkle, that is still an issue. You know, they're just not, it's not getting better. It's, it gets better in the short term but tomorrow or next week, it's still rough. That's when you might start uh, cross training it. So you might break up twinkle into like four lines, or I guess it's three lines, isn't it? Um, and you might rehearse those lines like out of order, or you might, um, you might even break it down to just like a set of intervals that are problematic. So like you might do that A to G interval, you know, like four times. And then you might go to the next interval that's problem. Maybe, maybe their first finger is inaccurate. So you might have them do just A, B, A. So you can like break it down to these, these small units and practice those all mixed up and only practice them for 10 seconds, move on to the next one, but then circle back, do it again, practice it in a different order. And then you go back and you try to put it in the context. And that, that's what more of an interleaved approach would look like. Now, I might be a little hesitant to do that with like younger beginners because, you know, they're just, it takes them longer to process information. And, um, you know, if you're like really mixing things up, I mean, I could see where like fifth and sixth graders are like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Right. Um, so I personally have not done it with younger kids, um, but I don't teach younger kids. So, uh, you know, this definitely works at the high school level, though. And, you know, I think if you're doing it with like middle schoolers or elementary, you just maybe change the pace of it, right? I mean, every everybody's pace is going to look different depending on that group. And I mean, I can tell you like the, the pacing with like, I mean, you saw the video of my second group. It's different when we're doing it like with our fifth or sixth orchestra. You know, there, it's not quite as rapid fire, just nonstop um, cause they just take a little bit longer to, to process and, and do all that stuff. So, um, yeah, I'd be curious if somebody tries this out and reads a little bit more about it and, mm -hmm. and see how it turns out when they do it with a younger classroom. Yeah. If you guys do, please put it in the comments. And I think with younger kids, you can teach them anything as long as it's chunked into smaller bits. Right. And Funny as you were talking, actually, those ideas remind me very much of the Galamian style of practicing scales and passages. And with this in mind, our conversation today is actually opening a door for a larger segment on our podcast, talking about different ways to practice and different strategies for practicing effectively. I hope this conversation today has provided some ideas for you to use in your classroom, whether you're working with private students whether you're working in a classroom situation or perhaps learning and practicing by yourself. We are going to have Ryan for a series of episodes. So I think I'm going to pause right here because there's quite a bit we have covered right now. It may be a good time to just pause, think about what we said and be back so we can hear his ideas about repertoire, selection, development of ensembles, and maybe more casual conversation about music and music education itself. Mm -hmm.